would like to, without further ado, um, introduce you to Harriet and Flora from Garfield Western, um, and they'll be here today to talk to you. And hopefully, I'll be able to share their presentation with you. Is that? Yep. Fantastic. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lizzie, for the introduction, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to, to be here, and um, I'm joined by Harriet Brooks, who's one of our grants managers. I'm Flora Craig. I'm the head of grants at the Garfield Western Foundation. Um, we're based in London, but um, in normal times, we travel around the UK and see lots of projects, so it may be that over time we might have met you at some point or been and seen some of the work that you do, hoping that we can get back to travelling again much sooner. But we're in the office today, so... Um, we're from our central London office um, on, on this call today. So we're really thrilled to be here and um, we're really hoping that today's session we can offer you some sort of helpful advice um, and encourage you, perhaps if you've never applied before, to think about applying to the foundation. And if you have applied before, then you might consider doing so again in the future as, as well. Um, before I get started, I just want to say, you know, a huge thank you to all of you for everything that you've done over the last year. I think um, it's been a really, really challenging time. And I think, um, you know, the trustees of the foundation really appreciate everything that you've all done for the voluntary sector, supporting people, particularly when they've been most in need, helping them with things that they probably hadn't anticipated they needed help with. And, you know, supporting, for example, people who are isolated or struggling with food or, or other, other things like that. And I think um, trustees, are, you know, really recognize what a wonderful job you've all done and have tried to remain as flexible as possible about their grant making. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about more that in a minute. So lots of you on this call might already be familiar with the name Garfield Western Foundation. You might even have applied to us before. Um, so don't, we're, we're going to cover quite a, a number of the sort of basics about how to apply to the foundation. Um, so if this is familiar to you, don't worry. Um, I won't be upset if you decide that you've heard this all before and you don't want to stay. But um, I, the rest of you, if it's new to you, then please do stay for the next few slides. So if I can have the next slide, please. So as a general sort of overview of the foundation, not everyone knows about the foundation and its background. And I think it's sort of helpful to set the tone if you're to think about applying to us so that you understand a little bit about the way the foundation works. So Garfield Weston was actually a Canadian businessman who moved his family to England in 1932 and he built a successful international business empire here. Um, the foundation itself was actually established in 1958 when he endowed a percentage of shares in the family business Whittington Investments to the foundation. And that's what allows the foundation to do the good work that it does. Within the Whittington Investment business portfolio, there's a very diverse group of businesses, everything from hotels to properties, retail, including um, the famous shop Fortnum and Masons, and also Associated British Foods, which is in a, a very large company and includes lots of household names, including things like Kingsmill Bread, Twinings Tea, and the fashion retailer Primark. So the trustees deal in ordinary down-to-earth things like bread and tea, and affordable fashion, and that's what helps them, enables them to do the good work that they do. Um, all our trustees are lineal descendants of the, of the founder, and so they're all members of the same family. They're very knowledgeable, they're very hands-on in their grant making, and um, they like to get involved in all aspects of what, of what the foundation does. So they're very, very hands-on, and this is a family foundation, so I think it, if you apply to us, it's important to remember that we, you know, this is a family that runs the foundation. We work for that family. Um, we've been able to give over a billion pounds to charity over the last 60 years. And um, in just in the last year alone, we gave 99 million pounds to over 2000 charities in um, across the whole of the UK. So we're probably one of the largest grant making trusts. Um, we're probably very, we're very broad in what we do. And I'll, I'll go on to tell you a little bit more about the kind of work that we fund um, if I could have the next slide, please. So this is just, um, just wait for the slides to catch up. This is just a very quick slide. Um, you know, I, I sometimes think I'm hoping that we'll, I'll remove this slide from my slide deck at some point. But it's just to tell you a little bit about our COVID-19 response, because we know that, you know, apart from the fact we've had a sort of 18 months that we have not expected, there's still an ongoing impact of the pandemic, and particularly for those who are on the front line 
um, dealing with issues that um, are still resonating in society as a result of COVID-19. So over, um, just to let you know how we responded to it, I know some trusts and foundations perhaps chose to close their doors for a while while they worked out what they wanted to do. We made a decision to remain open for business, making grants on a regular basis. And um, we've always actively encouraged new applications and we continue to do so last year as well. So whether or you've had funding or not from us in the past, you're very welcome to apply. Our um, trustees take a very pragmatic approach. So we've been as flexible as we can, um, including you know, offering resilience funding for core costs, as well as supporting strategic projects where charities have had plans that they wanted to put in place in order to respond to the situation they found themselves in. We also earlier in this year ran a special one-off fund for the cultural sector called the Western Culture Fund, which managed to give away over 30 million pounds to over a hundred cultural organizations across the UK with a view to try and get them to restart and re-engage with the audience and give, a, give us all a little bit more um, fun and entertainment back into life after a year of not being able to do some of those things that we all love doing. So we, um, we've been working remotely like lots of you probably have and maybe still are and we have technology in place to do so and we've sort of continue to work as hard as we can to support um, those who are doing great work uh, around the country. So if I can have the next slide, please, which I think we might have, great, we're in the right place, eligibility. So in terms of eligibility for um, applying to us, the important thing to know is you must be a registered charity or a CIO to apply. Um, we looked at the um, charity commission in order to deem whether somebody is eligible or not. So you, we, you will need to either have a registered charity number or be on one of their accepted or exempt lists. So for example, some churches or schools or educational establishments don't need a charity number. They're considered to be exempt in the eyes of the Charity Commission. So if you're not sure if you're eligible, then look to the Charity Commission for, for advice on that. Um, we don't fund CICs. It's quite a common question because I know they're structured similarly to charities, but we don't fund them because they have a slightly different um, Way, way of being structured and they're not registered with the Charity Commission. Um, we fund across the whole of the UK, so um, it, it, we're really keen to make sure that our money gets um, spread around the length and the breadth of, breadth of the country and we're always interested to hear from people who come from, from places where perhaps our funding hasn't been able to get to in the past before. So it doesn't matter where you're from, as long as you're registered in the UK, you can apply to us. We also fund across a really broad range of categories. So everything from youth and welfare, community work, but also we're interested in the environment, in education, health, and as I said before, arts and heritage. It's, it's really important that um, if you choose to apply to us, we, don't, we ask you to select the category that you think most represents the work that you're applying for, but um, please don't worry about whether you get that category right or wrong. There's no predetermined pot of money for each of the categories. So it doesn't benefit you to choose one category over another. Choose the one that you think represents what you're applying for most. And we will then take a look at that. We may even change it in terms of our own um, monitoring because obviously we use those categories to make sure we're spreading money as widely as we can around the voluntary sector. Um, there are a few things that we don't do. We don't fund animal charities. We don't fund individuals. We don't fund projects outside the UK, um, even if that charity is registered in the UK. And we don't tend to fund um, charities that prioritize campaigning or lobbying work. I think it would be fair to say that our trustees are really interested in supporting work that has a direct impact on the beneficiaries that it is that, that it wants to support. So they're, as, as I've said about them, they're sort of practical business people. They want to see their money doing good. So they like really practical solutions to problems that society faces. So those, those are our sort of main eligibility um, criteria. If I could have the next slide, please. So our types of grants, we're fairly straightforward. We might be a large funder, but we're straightforward in the approach that we take. We have two streams, I suppose, of funding. One is what we call our major grants, and those are for grants of over £100,000 and above. Now, those tend to be for projects that are over a million pounds or have uh, organizations with turnover of a million pounds. So are for large scale projects and we handle those individually. So we ask people to write an introductory letter about their project 
and then we will give you bespoke advice about how to apply, when to apply, to apply and if this is actually the right type of application for you to be making. So I'm not going to focus on major grants today because they are sort of, I suppose, the more specialist end of, of our grant making. What I want to talk to you today about is our regular grants programme, which is for grants of up to £100,000. So these are 90% of our, uh, the volume of our grants we make are regular grants. Um, they're mainly to small and medium sized charities working directly with local communities and beneficiaries. And we're very happy to support a, a whole range of activities within our regular grants. Um, the first of which is what we call unrestricted or core or revenue funding. So that's the bread and butter stuff you need in order to be able to run your organization. Trustees are very happy to be practical and support you just in the things that you need in order to do the good work you do. We also support project funding. So that's if you've got something that's very specific that you want to either set up that's new or as a specific strand of your work, you're very welcome to apply for that. And we also are a capital funder. So we can't do, we couldn't fund all three of these at once, but a capital fund might be ideal for you if you have a building project, you have something that needs fixing, or you have other items you need to buy that we would consider to be capital items. So for example, a minibus um, for the work that you do. With capital projects, if the building, we expect you to have your permissions in place. So planning permission and any other consents you need for your building. Um, we like you to have about half your funding in place as well before you approach us. Um, so, and it's likely, although not definite, we would give you around 10% of the total capital cost, but that would slightly depend what type of organization you are and what size your project is. One thing we don't do is we don't, um, we make multi-year grants, which I think is important to tell you about, and we'll talk about that probably a little bit later, but multi-year grants are grants where trustees can see that you do really good work and they want to give you a grant which will cover a period of years, normally either two or three years. If you want to apply for a multi-year grant, then we ask that you make sure you put in three-year budgets, if that's the number of years you want to apply for, as well as fundraising plans for that period of time as well. So we're very happy to look at multi-year grants. If you're new to the foundation, it may be that even if you ask for a multi-year grant, trustees might just decide to give you one year in the first instance just to see how your work goes to build up that relationship see what your report's like and then you're always welcome to come back and ask multi-year grant a multi-year grant at a later date um we don't fund specific named salary posts but we do expect um salaries to be part of your core cost so we know that if you apply with just a general core cost budget salaries will be part of that but what we don't do is support, for example, a named salary, po a named post in your organisation. And that's for the simple reason that we can't necessarily commit to funding that post forever. And trustees rightly wouldn't want to have the responsibility of the employment of a single person in your organisation, because if they one day decided that they couldn't fund you anymore, that might put that person's employment in jeopardy and they wouldn't want to do that. So those are our sort of types of grants. And if I could have the next slide, please. So this is about our application process and timeline. Um, I think probably you've been hearing from lots of funders over the last few days, and um, there's probably a recurring theme that you're now getting used to is that we really ask that you read our guidelines. Everything you need to know about the foundation is on our website and we'll send an email around after this, which gives you sort of clear links to what you need to know um, in order and what you can read before you consider making an application. The guidelines are absolutely there, written with you in mind. You don't have to be a professional fundraiser to follow them. They're very um, practical. They take you through step by step what we expect to see in an application. And I just always advise people, if you're feeling nervous about making an application, just follow the guidelines. There's a series of headings that we expect to see in a proposal. Follow those and you'll have a really good structure for your application to us. So make sure you've done that um, before anything else. Um, if you want to apply to us, you can apply online or you can apply in the post. We always ask, don't do both please, because that, as you can imagine, confuses the system somewhat. At the moment, I mean, I think probably 95% of our applications come to us online and, um, if you do it that way, you'll get immediate acknowledgement that your application has been submitted, so you're confident we can have it. 
or we have it in, in our system. The post, we're always happy to receive applications by post, but as you can imagine at the moment, the post is slightly, takes slightly longer. We're not always all in the office, so it will take slightly longer for it to be uploaded to our system and acknowledged. So the immediate way to feel confident is to apply online and 95% of people do it now. So we're hoping that it is straightforward for everyone. Um, you're very welcome to apply when you're ready to do so. So we don't have any deadlines. Um, our funding is done on a rolling program basis. So we look at applications in order of receipt and um, you apply when you're ready and we will look at your application in, in order of, of when we've received it. Um, the important thing to say about applying to us is you can only apply for one application at a time. So I alluded in the previous slide to the fact we do core costs and capital costs. <clears throat> it's always worth thinking ahead um, in terms of what you might need going forward, because we sometimes see people apply for core costs and then suddenly turn around and say, but actually we've got this great capital project. If you've got a live grant with us or you've been declined, you can't apply for it at least 12 month period. So make sure that you're thinking ahead for the thing that you need, think you need the most, and we seem to be the most appropriate funder for it. So absolutely, you know, you decide what you want, you apply when you want. Um, when we receive your application, we don't have a prescriptive form. So we give you, you are to write your own proposal in your own words. We give you a, a page limit, which we ask you to keep to of 10 pages. And um, the, the guidelines will help you sort of structure that, as I've said. Once we receive your application, um, one of our experienced team, lots of us have previously been fundraisers, will review your application. We'll be in touch if we think there's anything missing or we have any questions to ask. And um, should there be anything missing, you know, we'd like you to respond as soon as you possibly can so that we can make sure your application's in its strongest position to go to the trustees. Applications are then reviewed by trustees and they make the final decision. So there's every application is seen by a trustee. So there's no decision making that's done at the grants team level where your application isn't seen by, you know, doesn't ever get to that far. Every, every decision is made by a trustee in this, in this foundation. Um, applications are obviously have to be reviewed in date order just to try and be fair to everyone. So it's really important to think ahead strategically about when you might need the funding. It can take up to four months to get a decision. So I think be thinking ahead, say six months or so for when you might need the money before you apply to us. And that allows us to get, make sure that we've got everything we can, you get your decision in order. And we're not in a situation where you suddenly need emergency funding because that's very difficult for us to respond to in terms of being able to um, suddenly turn around an application very quickly. So we try and be fair to everyone, creating a level playing field. So you apply when you want for the thing that you want. And we look at that on its own merits, not in competition with other similar organizations or requests. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So it's just a, a, the next couple of slides, I just want to talk a little bit about top tips for making a good application. As you can probably tell from the numbers that I said at the beginning, in terms of applications we receive, we probably get about 4,000 applications a year and about 2,000 or so are successful. And so we see lots of different styles of applications and there are some things that I think it's worth conveying, which are about how to make yours stand out. Um, the first of which is really keep it focused. We allow you 10 pages for a proposal. And in that 10 pages, really tell us your story, You know who you are, what you do, why you do it, when you do it, who's it for, what benefit does it bring? We're really looking for a factually accurate, accurate application. We want it to stack up financially, but we also want to read a compelling story. You know, we use, we always say that we use our head and our heart in our grant making decisions. So we're very happy to, um, you know, hear about really the good stuff, the happy stories you might have to tell, the difference you might have made to someone's lives. Don't feel it's got to be incredibly dry and just factual. We like the colour that you can bring to it through the story that you can tell. So um, make sure that, you know, you're really thinking around that. And um, one of the things we always say to you is, please tell us what it is that you do. I think a lot of applications sometimes spend a lot of time introducing the subject that you might be working or the area you're working in. It could be your local area, 
It could be that you work with elderly people, for example. Don't spend lots of time telling us about those, the wider context of the area that you, that you say the indices of multiple deprivation or the situation that perhaps is facing elderly people. Tell us about what you're doing to address those situations. The trustees are pretty knowledgeable about the issues that um, the country and the society faces. So don't worry about giving us that sort of background context. Get, get to the story about you, what's relevant to you. Um, as I said before, we love to use our head and heart. So bring your application to life. We suggest you use case studies. We, you use pictures. Often, you know, a picture can tell a, a much better story than lots, lots, lots more words. Um, you can imagine we read lots of applications and sometimes those that are very, very dense in text in a very small font with no pictures are actually quite difficult to read. So try and make it pleasurable to read and tell that story through a mixture of quotes, case studies, pictures. Um, when you apply to us, you can upload a Vimeo or a link to YouTube. Please do that if you've got one. We do watch them. However, please don't worry if you don't have a any kind of video or sort of that kind of social media presence. You won't be penalised for it. It's nice to see them, but it doesn't, it won't impact on whether you're successful or not. And we certainly wouldn't want you going out, spending money preparing something like that just for our sake. So just if you've got one, share it with us. We always ask, there's quite a lot of information in our guidance about budgets. You know, we need to, we need to understand how you operate financially. So we need to see your income and expenditure. We need to see separate budgets if you're asking us for um, capital funding or project funding so that we can understand the wider context of your work and then the specific thing you're asking for. So make sure you've provided all of that. Um, one of the things we also need to see is a realistic fundraising plan. And I suppose it's probably wider than fundraising. It's an income generating plan. And we know over the last year that it's been difficult to generate income. You haven't been able to have jumble sales or cake sales or people haven't been able to do sponsored runs. The kind of things, you know, charity shops haven't been open. The kind of things that lots of charities rely on for earned income have sort of disappeared. Hopefully they're building back now, but it's really useful to tell us the kind of the different types of income that you're anticipating getting so that we get a sense that you've got a kind of broad mix, a sustainable plan, and that if, whether we fund you or not, you're able to sort of survive on a kind of annual basis. We know it's not easy, but we know, you know, it's good to show that you, you know, you've really thought about how you're going to make your charity work. One thing our trustees really like is um, local fundraising. Um, we know that's not going to be the sort of enormous amount of money that you might need to run your charity. But what local fundraising tells trustees is that your charity has um, a reputation locally. People like it. They're willing to come out and spend money to support it. And so I think even if it's small amounts of money, tell us about those things you do locally in order to make sure that you can um, fund, your, fund your work. I think it's 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 really useful, particularly as you know we don't we can't necessarily travel the length and the breadth breadth of the country and see every single project. It's great for you to set that local context in in your application to us. Um, we always like you to have some funds raised before you come to us. So as part of your fundraising plan, we'd like to see what's confirmed. You may have some other things that you know are pending that you've applied for but you haven't heard the result of yet. And also you might be sort of confident getting certain amounts of money because you know that on a regular basis you receive certain income, say from earning, hiring out your space or whatever. So tell us, by all means, put your funding plan in place and put notes alongside it if you want to explain whether things are you're confident of, whether you're less confident, whether it's a new funder. So we can get a sense of how much um, funding we think realistically you're, you're capable of raising. Um, we like to, we, we also think that, you know, when you um, apply to us, one of the things that's really helpful to do is to um, perhaps get somebody, once you've got it all drafted up, is get somebody to look through the application for you. This could be someone, a sort of critical friend who sort of knows you a little bit, but doesn't know you brilliantly. Get them to read it through so that they can um, give you some feedback about, does it make sense? Are you really singing your praises enough? A lot of people don't. A lot of people play down the good work they do. And, um, you know, or sometimes make it very difficult to understand just because they're very um, into the detail of it, but we need to really understand the big picture stuff. 
So get somebody to help you with it. It's, it's not easy writing a fundraising application. So lean on anyone you can for a little bit of support there because they'll give you a bit of feedback before it then comes to a funder like us for a decision. Can I have um, the next slide, please? So the next slide should be, have we jumped on? It should be called Common Pitfalls. Yes, perfect. So these are some of the things that we see in our in applications, which are, are probably best avoided. Um, we always take the view that you are the experts in what you do. You know, we, we don't necessarily understand your work and we certainly don't understand it as well as you do. So you really do need to work hard to make it really clear for us. Um, so one of the things that we see quite a lot in applications is people fall into the trap of using jargon or acronyms or a kind of sort of corporate shorthand um, in order to e e explain what you do. I mean, I think we're all guilty of that. I'm sure as funders, we all talk in sort of particular language that other people wouldn't necessarily understand. So make sure you're really using plain English. You know, if there's a particular thing you do, have you explained it really clearly as if somebody's reading it? For the first time, you know, make sure that um, you know, you know, we we understand it, you know, and can understand it clearly. Acronyms are the same. I mean, just don't make, you know, we don't want to have to look them up and try and decipher what they mean. Um, we know that, for example, with things like local authority or some government funding, it's sometimes very acronym heavy. We don't want to read applications full of acronyms. We'd much rather you just explained it to us as clearly as possible. We know that people struggle with their fundraising plans, so I really would recommend you look in our guidance and make sure that you um, you just follow. We give you an example of what we think a fundraising plan should look like. I would use that as your sort of structure. It may not be all the, ti the titles and headings may not fit with you, but use it as your structure and you'll have hopefully a really clear way of describing the things that you're confident about versus the things that you know you still have yet to raise. We're really looking to get a sense of an organisation that's got a really robust plan. We know that fundraising doesn't always come off exactly as you planned it, but the fact you've got a really good plan gives us confidence you know what you're doing and how you're running your organisation. We find sometimes with finance that people with their budgets don't have their budgets up. Sounds a bit bizarre to say that, but we'll have these sort of hugely detailed tables or um, charts which show all the costs or income coming into an organization and then at the bottom there'll be no total um, that, in, that obviously leaves us to get the calculator out and try and work it out for you I, I'd always rather not do that because um, it's your budget you should tell us exactly what it is and I don't want to get it wrong for you so just make sure that kind of thing's right and also when you read the application through or get your critical friend to do it make sure that you um, your numbers are consistent throughout the document. So, you know, you may have written a covering letter, which is asking for a £25,000 grant. Then somewhere in the body of the text, you're telling us, oh, well, actually it's going to cost 30, but then the budget says 32. I think you just really make sure that we don't get confused because if it's not consistent throughout um, the document, it starts to question what else might not be quite right. Um, so just double check that and make sure it's nicely consistent. We ask um, that you submit your latest set of accounts. Um, if ideally the ones that, you know, even if you've got them in draft form and they're the closest version, they're just waiting for signing, then you're welcome to sign those, send those to us. Just explain that they're to be signed at a trustee meeting in the near future. Um, the other thing to do with your accounts is make sure in your application to us is explain anything that might be unusual or out of the ordinary in your accounts. And, and things that I'm thinking of are things like you might have received fantastically a legacy that has really made a difference to your finances. You might have chosen to operate at a deficit for a couple of years to bring your reserves back down in, in line. You may have just um, got a very large amount of reserves because you're saving up for a capital project. If you think there's anything that looks a bit unusual, make sure you explain that to us in your application because we don't want to look at your accounts and jump to conclusions about, oh, that you've got too much money or you uh, perhaps aren't as solvent as you could be. So if there's something that you think looks out of the ordinary, just, just drop, put a line in the proposal which says, in our accounts, you'll notice this and this is why this has happened. So don't leave us to just jump to conclusions. Um, always make sure that we talk a bit more about the narrative, make sure the narrative is, is really straightforward. 
I'd also say if you've applied to us before, make sure you start from the beginning because it's quite easy to think, well, are they given me a grant before? So I'll just start at the beginning of this project and tell them, you know, what it is I need this time round. Reset the scene for us because we, as you can tell, we see a lot of applications. It's always a pleasure to read them, but we do sometimes need to be reminded what, you know, the who, who, where, what, why, what, you know, about the organisation. Give us that context, then go on to tell us about what it is you'd like us to help you with. Um, I think it would be fair to say we will come back to you. We might have to come back to you if we have questions. Um, when we do that, I know you're all busy. You've got a million other priorities. Please try and come back as soon as you can with the information we've requested. Quite often we find, and I know this is because people have other things and other priorities, people don't respond to that question for additional information. The reason we're asking you is perhaps we think your application isn't as strong as it could be if it had this extra bit of information we've requested. So please send it to us because our job is to try and make sure that you put forward the best application possible and, and to support the trustees making a good decision. So if you give us what we think we need, then hopefully that will get you in a strong position to get the, the response you want from the foundation. Um, I suppose with every, um, every talk like this, I have to say, you know, we can tell if you haven't read the guidelines, if you've just decided to do your own thing, um, it's funny how I think people sometimes think that they want to just write it in their own words and do it their own way. That's absolutely fine, but make sure you've at least ticked off everything in the guidelines. It, it, you know, it's always a real pleasure to read an application that's clearly very well thought out and has told us everything we need to know because it makes our jobs easier and it makes it much easier for trustees to be able to support the work that you do. So, you know, as always, please read the guidelines. Um, I think that's it from me. I don't know how we're doing for time, but there, hopefully there's some time for some questions. Um, but thank you for listening. And um, we'll move over to um, Lizzie, who will help with some questions, I think. Lizzie, I think I'm you sorry. I'm so sorry. You'd have thought after all of this time, I would have learned that. Um, so thank you, Flora, for that. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions. Um, I can see Chris and Nick have got their hands raised and then there are a number of questions in the chat, if that's OK, Flora. Yeah. So, um, Chris, I think uh, if it was all right to go to you first, because I think you raised your hand first. Thank you. Yeah, fine. Hi, Flora. Um, uh, I work for a, a charity in North Yorkshire that provides opportunities for adults with learning disabilities. Um, we were recently uh, unsuccessful with an application to Garfield Weston um, and we received a, a fairly generic email, I would, I would guess, in terms of um, a whole host of reasons as to why the application might have been as unsuccessful. Is it possible to provide any more sort of specific um, feedback on, um, not, not, not necessarily a huge, huge amount of detail, but if it was something like the fund, fundraising plan wasn't clear, or um, the impact wasn't sufficiently demonstrated. Just, just a one-liner, just so that when you make an yeah. application the next time, we know where to refocus. Uh, it's a very fair question. I think funders are often asked this for feedback because they, um, it's you know, it is really important to you to know well why did this go wrong and how can I make it better. Uh, we don't, on the whole, give feedback uh, as a as a sort of part of our the course of what we do, and that's partly because we uh, obviously work in quite a high volume way. And sometimes feedback is very difficult to give because it's not that there's anything that particularly went wrong. It just so happened that the trustees, they, they have to make some very difficult decisions. And on that day, the decision didn't go in your favor. However, Chris, I'm very happy if you email, if you're able to email me afterwards or Harriet when she sends it around, we'd be very happy to look at yours in, in particular and just maybe give you a couple of pointers if that's helpful. That would be great, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Flora. Um, Nick, I can see you've got your hand raised. Go to you next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Flora. Um, I'm, I'm Nick and from the Centre for Health and Pastoral Care, a mental health organisation based in Thursk in North Yorkshire. Um, unfortunately, we, we, haven't, we haven't been successful in our grant applications to Garfield Western over a number of years. Um, but I wondered, before making another application, whether there is a, whether it would be because um, because I was just thinking of Chris when he mentioned about the feedback and everything, but that uh, he'd received um, whether there was someone before making an application that I could I could speak with and perhaps go over things 
um, which might save the whole process, <laughs> um, both my time and obviously the time time of you know with the application going in, um, because there may be some things that fundamentally that uh, that we're not doing quite right or not following or or yeah yeah, yeah I mean I think. Uh... We're always happy to give advice over the telephone in any case. So if anyone's putting together an application and they've got specific questions about, oh, I'm a bit stuck, how do I get this fundraising um, plan to work? I'm not quite sure how to reflect this part of my organisation. We're really happy to try and help with those specific questions. Um, what's sometimes difficult for us to do is sort of have a quite a generic conversation with somebody about, you know, the work they're going to do and how what the kind of things they might apply for, because, of course, I don't know, you know, I don't want to guide you into well, apply for this and not that because I don't know what the trustees are going to decide. So I think I would always advise people to get to a place where they feel quite, quite sort of um, prepared, well prepared and, and not knowing about what they want to apply for and then perhaps pick up the phone. But again, if, if you've if you've had a situation where you haven't been successful over a number of times, then perhaps if you we could perhaps look at that as a take this that offline and have a look and see if there's any particular guidance. Yes, really appreciate that, Flora. Um, and also, we, we would actually very much welcome if um, if anyone wishes to actually come and visit as well. We, we tend to find that when people have actually come and visit, then they can see also. Um, but I realise everyone's everyone's very busy. Yeah, well, no, we. I mean, we do love visiting things. I mean, there's no doubt that you know it's one of the greatest pleasures of my job is getting on a train and coming to see lots of interesting projects. It, uh, as always, it's, you know, how many can I fit into a day, a week, a month, but, you know, but, but thank you for the invitation. That's very kind. Thank you for that. Thanks, Nick. So um, we had a question um, in the chat before from Anne-Louise. She'd like to know if the 10% of total costs and half the funding in place is also the criteria that applies to your major grants. It slightly depends. I'm always really hesitant around percentages because they really do depend on the type of organisation you are, the size of your project. Um, in terms of major grants, I would uh, we're talking about organisations that have over a million pound turnover, so we're expecting them to be pretty sophisticated in terms of both their fundraising and their planning, their other income generation. So I would expect them to be very confident of having about 50% in place already. And then it slightly depends what type of organisation it is and what it might be applying for. One of, the, one of the things I sometimes recommend people do is, and we publish all our grant making both on 360 Giving, but also on our own website and in our annual reports. Sometimes it's worth looking at those because you'll see a list of every fund that we've given over the course of a year. And that just sometimes gives you a sense to sort of gauge, you know, similar types of organisations you might know, the similar size they are, the kind of grant we might have given them. I mean, it's not a science, so there's not a kind of exact, well, those people, they're just like me and they're the same size and they got 30,000, so therefore I'm going to get 30,000. It's not that exact, but it does give you a flavour of the sort of breadth and depth of our grant making. Thank you, Flora. Um, they, is that okay? That answers the question, I hope. Um, then we have a um, question from Kathy. She said, do you fund projects within a wider project, for example, a specific exhibition in a new museum. Also, what proportion of core costs do you support in your grants? Thank you. So, yes, we would fund a project within a project. If you had a specific activity within a museum you wanted to come to us for, I would, I would say about arts and cultural projects, trustees are probably most interested in the sort of outreach and education benefits, you know, not just the, the show is one thing, putting on a new show is one thing, but actually it's the impact it's going to have, who's going to visit, how you're going to get those people engaged in it. So I think make it as people focused as possible. In terms of core costs, again, it, you know, I would say probably no more than 20% of your total turnover. But again, that's a that really depends on the size of your organisation. If you're a five million pound turnover organization we're, we're not going to give you 10 to 20 percent of your turnover because that would be a very large grant so it really it really depends on the size um but i think you know what we're really interested in seeing from people is their income and expenditure what they're confident of raising and then what they think their projected shortfall is likely to be and the trustees will then take a view so you don't necessarily uh, i'd always say don't get too hung up about what exactly you ask for. I mean, obviously, for your planning purposes, you want to have a figure in mind for your own strategy. 
but our trustees are very experienced grant makers. So if they they show, you'd say you're a hundred thousand pound turnover organisation, you've got a shortfall of thirty, and you're confident of seventy, they'll take a view and think, well, that sounds like the kind of organisation we might give ten or fifteen thousand to. So they, you know, they're making very practical decisions based on the information you provide them. So don't get to, if you, particularly if you're quite a small organisation, don't get too hung up on exact amounts, you know, because they will take a view. Thanks, Flora. Um, hopefully that was okay, Cathy. Um, and then we have a question from Helen. So she says, I've always been put off from applying to Garfield Western because of the need to have raised some funds already. Many other funders asked for a project. Can you please give us some examples of how much was raised, for example, or et cetera? How much was raised for the project? Or... Mm. Yes, I guess towards the project. Perhaps, well, Helen, if you're able to oh, expand. Or... Sorry, Laura. Hi. What I meant by that is I've, I've been working in advocacy for like the last 20 years, and every time I've looked at Garfield Western, I've never applied. Um, because the bit where it, it confuses me with the bit for having funds in place, yeah. Because mo most of the time it's like, I think, okay, well, we need a, an advocacy service for older people. So I, I put in a bid for an advocacy service for older people because that's the need I've identified. So, so it just doesn't, it just it doesn't work in my, it, maybe it's just my brain. Um, so I, I'm thinking that having listened to this, I might be better looking organisationally and saying, actually, as an organisation, we need 120,000 a year. We know we've got... 80,000 and them doing application that way but yeah am I making sense Sorry. yes you are and I think I would if you're that kind of size organization so 120,000 pound turnover I'd recommend you just telling us about your organization and all the different things you do and the benefits that that gives people and then tell us about just the fundraising for the overall organization I think you know it as you can tell we're a very broad funder and so our guidelines have to sort of they have to work for somebody who just needs, you know, a thousand pounds to get their roof fixed to somebody yeah. who's doing a multi-million pound, you know, health project in the country. So, you know, we they have to, that's why it's very difficult to give, you know, they are by nature a little bit generic, but I think for your size of organisation, you'd be better off just telling us about the impact you have as an organisation and just coming to us for some core costs. You can still then apply those core costs to specific projects if you want, because that's part of what you do as an organisation but maybe come to us for a kind of a contribution towards the running costs of the organisation um, and tell us the whole story. Lovely, thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Flora. Um, our next question comes from Nick, and she'd like to know, does the 12 month period for reapplication relate to 12 months from the previous application or 12 months from the decision on the previous application? So it's, tw sense. it's 12 months from the decision. So if you apply to us, um, and it, it's well, it's it's 12 months from the decision, but if you, for example, get a multi-year grant and the decision is we're going to fund you for the next three years, you can't come back until that multi-year grant is completed and you've reported on it. So for example, it'd be three years beyond that first decision, if that makes sense. So the general rule is you have to, you if it's a normal grant for just a one year, if we say yes or no, you have to wait 12 months. And if you've been successful, report on it, send in your report, and then you can reapply again. And then, you know, there are increments beyond that if the grant period was for longer. So if, it, for example, it was a capital project and the capital project is going to take two years, we wouldn't really expect to see you back until that work's done and reported on, then you can consider coming back again. Same for a multi-year grant. Thanks, Laura. And another question from Nick. Um, does the 10% of total costs and half the funding in place criteria relate to the applicant's organisation or the funding being applied to for, from Garfield Western? Hope I've articulated that correctly, Nick. Can Nick just ask that question, just that so I've understood it? Sorry. Are you there, Nick? I am sorry, I've just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. It was I just wondered if the 10% related to the if if you're up to, to the, the project that you're applying for or the organization's costs, or does it depend whether you're applying for project funding or core funding? It, it slightly applies, it depends on what you apply for. So if it's just an organization funding and it costs you a hundred thousand pounds to run your organization, we'd be looking at around 
let's say £10,000. And I say that around because it yes. could be 15, it could be slightly less. It depends what your shortfall is and your plan for fundraising. If you want to come for a very specific project, so let's say you're a larger organisation, half a million pound turnover, where you want to start a new project that costs £100,000, we would probably expect you to have at least half the funding in place. And we would then give you a contribution to what is left within that project pot, as it were. So, you know, it might be that we give you only 10% of that project pot, but it may be that the trustees think well, this is a great project, you know, in it, which is part of a much larger, larger organisation. So we'd feel confident about giving you a little bit more. But again, you know, I think it's it's about not being too hung up about the exact amount you apply for. Our, our trustees make decisions all the time. And often you might come and say, I'd like 50. And they might say, do you know what, for this type of organisation might give you 30 or 35. Sometimes they give you more than you ask for. So don't worry too much about getting that figure exactly right. Okay, thank you. Great, and I think Nick also had one a, a little bit on the end of that on her question was, what is Garfield Weston's view on levels of reserves? Oh, it's always, this is a, um, a question that we are, we're often asked, and I think every funder um, is asked it. We, we have a view that if you have uh, over 12 months of available cash within your organisation, so basically a whole year's worth of cash in reserves, then you've probably got slightly too much money. And that's why we ask you, I mean, it is a bit of a Goldilocks thing in that too few reserves, if you look like you're really on the last, you know, thousand pounds of your organisation, that is worrying to us too much, you know, a year's worth, sounds like you can probably manage without us. So we're looking at somewhere probably in the middle. Um, and that's why we really suggest you do make sure you explain anything unusual in your accounts, because you might have a year's worth of cash and some organisations do because of the nature of their work, because they know that if they had to wind up, for example, in health organisations, they might have to deal with um, moving patients, you know, to, to, um, closing whole parts of their work, which would be very cost costly so explain if you think they feel like they're too big or people have asked that question before just explain this is what our trustees have decided they think the reserves level are this is the logic behind it and then our trustees can take a view I think that you know the worst thing you can do is have those figures in your accounts and just not explain them to us because then of course we we're just left making a guess about well do they are they going to spend this money why have they got so much money or you know how are they going to manage going forward so definitely just you know be as, be as open and transparent as you can be about it. Thanks, Flora. Another, another question, I can just see another three at the moment. I hope that's okay. Um, saying, hi, Flora, you mentioned visiting organisations. Do the grants team or trustees make visits to organisations with a current grant? And is that based on your interest or by request of the organisation itself? It's a real mixture. So, I suppose our priority is always to, and this, this feels sort of like a long time ago that we were doing this. I mean, I used to be probably out of the office two, two days a week visiting different organisations. It tends to be that the priority for us is obviously to visit applications that we have that are live, that are awaiting a decision. So they're things that we feel that we need to see in order for the trustees to be able to make a decision on them. But what we do is obviously we're travelling around the country all the time. So if somebody has received a grant from us, and they happen to be in the area of one of those places that we're visiting, we often try and visit as much as we can to make the most of the train fare or the, you know, the travel that we've had to invest in. So I might come, you know, somewhere up in Yorkshire to where you're based to come and see a particular applicant. But I would also say to the team, who else is in the area that I could perhaps pop into that we've given a grant to recently? So we could just come and see how your work is and, you know, what you're doing, just say hello. Um, Sometimes these visits can be quite short. They're just very um, meant to be very friendly and informal, um, but they're also opportunities for you to meet us. So there's no exact science to it, I'm afraid, but um, you know, we do try and come and see as much as we can when we can. So we were just talking about going, getting out, yes. weren't we, before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question here from Simon. Um, sorry, my uh, chat has just jumped. Uh, Bear with you one moment. It said you suggested that as a new applicant, trustees might support an initial single year, and if they like what they would see, they might support more in the future. Would you recommend still submitting an application as a three or five year funding plan? So I think um, for a start, our multi year grants don't tend to be more than three years at the moment. So <clears throat> make that your maximum three years. I would always recommend to applicants 
we always want you to ask for what you need the most. And so if you're, what you would like the most is three years worth of funding, ask for that and put those, the budgets in for those relevant three years and the fundraising plans. The trustees will then take a view. If you're completely new to them and they, maybe they don't know your work or they haven't heard of you before, they might just say, well, actually, I think we're just gonna give this charity one year in the first instance. Then you, that would be a 12 month grant. You'd then report back on that. Once you've reported back on that, um, providing everything's in order, you'd then be welcome to apply again. And I would imagine then if you've been successful, reported successfully to it, then you could ask again and say, actually, do you know what we really need is, is three years of support and trustees would probably look more favourably then because they'd feel a bit more confident. Thank you, Flora. Thanks, Simon, for the question. We have a question here from Mags. She says, when you ask what has already been raised towards a project, does that include any income? So in brackets, contracts, grants, government funds, as well as what has been raised by the charity themselves via its own activities, for example, events, donations, just giving appeals, etc. And then how much needs to be raised already be what they're asking for? So this, I mean, it's, it is, it's always going to be a mixture. Every fundraising plan is, you know, starts off at the beginning of the year and you have a target to reach and you've got a whole range of, I, I mean, I suppose income generating plan. You've got lots of different ways of generating income. So yes, we'd like to see the full picture. So if you know that every year you're going to get some contract income, which represents 20% of your turnover, then tell us about that because you're confident about that. Then tell us about the other things that you perhaps, you know, you know that on a regular year you earn income through a shop or through hiring space. Tell us about those amounts. You can always put a notes column to say, you know, on an average year, we tend to get £5,000 from this type of source. You know, it won't, we know it won't necessarily all be in the bank at that point, but we can tell that you're confident that it all being well, everything will, that will fall in place. And then in terms of other bits of funding, I mean, it's best to kind of, I suppose, separate them into those that are confirmed bits of funding, those that's pledged and those that are yet to be raised, which is effectively your shortfall, what you've got left to go. So I, that's how you need to structure it. What we always say to um, applicants is, you know, we like to see some money in place already. And that could be as simple as, you know, your regular contract or, um, I don't know, support from the Arts Council or whoever who gives you sort of regular um, support or your or money that you know is coming in or even your reserves brought forward. So we like to see that you've got something before you come to us. I suppose that, you know, turning it on its head, the worst case scenario for our trustees is you tell us about a great project, you show us the budget and then you say, well, we haven't really got anything. So it'd be great if you could give us as much as possible towards this. That just makes the trustees feel, I suppose, nervous because, you know, even if they love it, helping you out for one year doesn't give them the confidence necessarily that you've got a sustainable plan about what you're going to do next year if they didn't fund you how you're going to diversify your sources of income so they're looking for a really sensible practical plan you know in terms of amounts and types of income thank you um question from tom here if you're a western charity award winner are you still able to apply for the garfield western foundation yes you are Yes, you are. Hopefully that's that's good news, Tom. Um, let's see if there's any other questions in there. There was a very kind offer from uh, Emma from Selfa um, saying they've received funding from Garfield Western and benefited from a year with Pilot Light as we were a Western Charity Award winner back in 2016. If anyone would like to have a chat about what they applied for, please get in touch with, uh, with Emma from Selfa. Lots oh, of thank you, Emma. That's really kind. I mean, it actually, it's really helpful for us um, when people who have been successful with us are happy to talk to other people who are perhaps un underconfident or have never been successful or don't know quite how to structure an application, then, you know, the, the more that people who've actually received money are able to say how they found the experience and maybe offer that support. I mean, I think for all fundraisers, that's always a fantastic offer. So thank you, Emma, for doing that. My pleasure. I think um, one of the things that because you can get the core costs um, funded um, by Garfield West, and it makes such a big difference to us, doesn't it? Because, you know, it's um, it's like the holy grail of funding. <laughs> Yes. And it just means you can do so much more with it. And really, you know, for our organisation, it's really helped us to grow and invest in our infrastructure. And I would say, I'm not, who else was it? Was it Tom had said about the Western Charity Award mm -hmm. winners? I literally, in my 20 plus years in the voluntary sector, that was the best year 
for for our organization for me personally if you get the chance to go for um the western charity awards do because it, it literally transformed our charity it was great i still like five years on uh, really buzz about it because it was so good so let a plug for the the, the pilot light there <laughs> oh well that's fun that's fantastic to hear and if people want to find out more about the western charity awards they can look on our website and in fact i think applications tend to open towards the end of this year with a deadline in january so you can have a look and see if you're um you might fit within the eligibility criteria for that but as emma says it's you know we know it's a really transformational program for the charities that are selected to be part of it and and a generous offer as well from tom here saying uh, this is where we are now in the this is what we are in the process of now it's a great process we're also happy to chat to people and that's tom from saint nick so i'm sure people will be taking you up on the uh, on the opportunities 